Amen, 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 amen. Come on, Elmwood, put your hands together. Let's give God some praise. I know, I know, I know, I know. It is gloomy outside. It is gloomy outside, but this is still the day that the Lord has made. And no matter what it looks like outside, no matter what it feels like inside, we are called, we are commanded to rejoice and be glad in it. Listen, I know who's in the room today. When I look around, I know who is here. These are the people who decided I'm not going to let the rain, I'm not going to let the cloudy sky keep me from the house of the Lord. I got some prayer warriors in the house who push their way and press their way to worship because they just had to be in the presence of the Lord. Is that who I have in the room? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I got some grateful people in the building today. Some people who said, look, 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 God has been too good to me for me to stay home. I've got to get into the presence of the Lord. Imani, you better praise him. You better praise him, Imani. Yeah, I, I know who is in the room today. I, I got some folks with some testimonies in the room today. Some folks who can say, look, uh, the devil tried it this week, but he didn't succeed. So I've got to make my way to worship to give God some praise for keeping me in the midst of the attack. I know who's in the room today. I, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know, I know. I know who's here. I know who's here. These are my worshipers. These are my prayer warriors. These are the grateful folks. These are the ones who said, look, I'm not going to let a little bit of rain keep me from the house of worship. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I, I also know that some of y'all are here for the choir. <laughs> and I am not mad at you because today is Choir Appreciation Sunday. It is Choir Appreciation Sunday. This is the second year that we have taken time to really honor and give thanks for the ministry of our choirs, our sanctuary choirs, our youth choir, our senior choir, our men's choir, Ruhok, our women's choir. Oh, I shouldn't have started that. I got them all. I think so too. Our concert choir, core. We thank God for the way they have ministered to our souls throughout the years. How many of you can say, I've been blessed, I've been encouraged, I've been lifted up? by the choir on Sunday morning. We give thanks for our director of music and worship arts, the Vinroy Brown, who will celebrate eight years with Elmwood United Presbyterian Church come January. He has been a blessing to our church. He's been a blessing to me, and we give thanks for him. We thank God for our musicians, Jeremy and Daniel. We thank God for Core. Yeah. And of course, we give thanks for Jean James. Minister Jean James served Elmwood for well over 30 years. And every time we acknowledge our choir, 
Jean will be here. Because honoring our choir means also honoring those who have come before us and have set the tone and the standard of excellence that we now live into. So we thank God for you. So today, choir appreciation collides with the celebration of Advent. And so I thought it would be fitting to preach Mary's song of praise, also known as the Magnificat. Magnificat in the Latin means magnify. Mary's song, come on and stand to your feet, opens with these words. My soul magnifies the Lord. So come on and join me in the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter, verses 46 through 56. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowly state of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. Indeed, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his child Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
This mic is on. Thank you, Tay. I, I thought I was going to have to shift gears and start preaching a whole nother sermon. Those who are in the um, narthex can come in and be seated since we're waiting. Amen. Welcome. You are right on time. Good to see you. Good to see you. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowly state of his servant. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for the ways that you have already moved in this worship experience. We thank you for this preaching moment, this moment where we get to hear from you, this moment where we get to bring our questions and hopefully, prayerfully receive the answers that you have for us. God, in this moment, we ask that you open us up. Open us up. Because God, when we're open, we not only give, but we're able to receive. And God, we need to receive a word from you. This Christmas season is unlike any other season that we've experienced before. And so we need a word from you, God. We've got some questions. You are the answer. Speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Y'all going to roll with me today? We going to roll. Whether you roll or not is up to you because you're either going to get left or get run over. It's up to you. Um, or you can just roll with us. But let's see what God has to say today um, in this text. Um, I want to preach from the thought, God in the rubble. God in the rubble. I came across some images on social media this week, and they have had a profound impact on me. Since seeing these images online, I literally have not been able to get them out of my mind. They have taken root on the inside of me and I can't shake it. There are some things that you see on social media and you're like, oh, I can keep on scrolling. But this, these images arrested me, Anita. I couldn't just scroll past the images. I had to stop and pause. I had to enlarge it and double click it and, and, and I had to analyze it. It deeply impacted me. Let me show you the images that I saw. Media Ministry, can you pull them up? There's another one that gets a little bit closer. I figured that one might be, there we go. So let me tell you what you're looking at. Bethlehem's Lutheran Church decided to alter its Christmas nativity scene to reflect the reality of children living and being born in Palestine today. So what you just saw in those images is a symbolic baby Jesus lying in a manger of rubble and destruction. Reverend Munther Isaac 
says this about the nativity scene. He says, if Christ were to be born today, he would be born under the rubble. Think about this. Can I, can I, um, can we get the shovels out and dig a little bit deeper today? Think about this. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, a Palestinian Jew, If Jesus were to be born today, because of the ongoing conflict between Hamas and Israel, Jesus would be born under the rubble caused by the consistent bombings. Not only are these images disturbing because they bring us back to the birth of Jesus. They are disturbing because they are a reminder that there are women giving birth in Palestine today and their babies are literally being born under the rubble. And here we are trying to figure out what color bulbs we're gonna put on our trees. Here we are trying to figure out how we are going to decorate the outside of our home. And we have women in Palestine giving birth under the rubble. Also this week, the churches of Palestine have announced that all Christmas celebrations and festivities will be canceled in an expression of unity with Gaza and rejection of the ongoing aggression against Palestinians. Think about how deeply disturbing this is. There will be no celebration of the birth of Jesus in the place where Jesus was born. Allow me to pause parenthetically, lest my comments come across as being anti-Semitic. What the bombing of Israel at the hands of Hamas was not okay. It was horrific. I do not endorse it. My criticism of the actions of Israel does not make me anti-Semitic. <laughs> Nor am I aligned with Hamas. We can be critical of both and still speak out about the ongoing injustice that is happening at the hands of Israel. We can do both. These images have been with me all week. This has bothered me all week. The thought that there will be no celebration of the birth of Jesus in the place where Jesus was born, I, I just could not move on business as usual. And I know it's supposed to be a happy day because it's choir appreciation day, but this Christmas is different. This has bothered me all week long. And then I came to our scripture passage this morning. Mary's song. And I was reminded 
that the conditions for Palestinian Jews during that first Christmas really aren't that different from the, from the conditions of Palestinian Jews today. Let's go back and look at the context from which this song emerges. I know that we all love the image of the clean and pristine nativity scene. Some of you have them on your lawns, I know you do. This is where Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus are all in the manger. Jesus is wrapped in swaddling clothes. His doting parents are looking over him and these barn animals are calmly and quietly surrounding them. Does that sound familiar? But let me tell you, even though it gives us good, feel good feelings and reminds us of Christmas, it is far from the reality of what the birth of Jesus looked and felt like at the time. The birth of Jesus was not this meek and mild event. The birth of Jesus was a disruption. It was radical, revolutionary. And in a way, Jesus was born under the rubble. When Jesus was born, the Jewish people were struggling to survive under a Roman oppressive structure. A structure systematically designed to keep God's people socially, politically, economically, and spiritually marginalized and disenfranchised. Preach, pastor. I think I will. I think I will. For years, God's people prayed for a savior. For years, they believed that God, just like he sent Moses and raised up Moses to deliver Israel from Egypt, they prayed and asked God to send them a savior to deliver them from the Roman Empire. They believed this savior would lead them into battle, overthrow the Roman government, and restore Israel to their traditional greatness. And after 400 years, 400 years of praying, 400 years of waiting, 400 years of wondering, is God going to show up? After 400 years, God finally responds. God sends a savior into the world, but he doesn't come as a strong and fearless leader. He doesn't come armed and ready for battle. God, through Jesus, enters this world as a baby boy small, weak, vulnerable, helpless, powerless. But not only that, this baby was not born to a king or a queen. This baby was not born to a military leader or a member of the elite. This baby was born to poor Palestinian Jewish parents. Family, this is the context for our text this morning. In our text, Mary had just had a divine visitation from an angel of the Lord. And this angel, Gabriel, informs Mary that God had chosen her to be the Theotokos. The Theotokos, the, the God bearer. Gabriel tells her, that she will give birth to a son. A miracle, because Mary was a virgin. 
The angel goes on to say, and you will call him Jesus. Now Mary receives this word from the angel and she does what most of us do. She went and visited with her cousin Elizabeth. If Mary was here today, she would have texted Elizabeth like, girl, let me tell you what the Lord just told me. Can you believe this? They didn't have those options back then. If they did, I'm sure that she would be texting on an iPhone, however. But they didn't have those options back then, so she did the, be she did the best she could with what she had. She went, she traveled to see her cousin, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is also expecting a miracle child, a child born to her in old age. And when Elizabeth confirms for Mary what the angel had already said to Mary, Mary responds with a song. Our text is Mary's song. The Magnificat. But it is also a hymn of the Anawim. We, we gonna learn something today. Anawim, translated from the Hebrew, means the poor. The poor of the Lord was a designation for children, widows, foreigners, and others who were economically and socially impoverished. In other words, this song, Mary's song, the Magnificat that the choir just sang so beautifully, is the song of the oppressed. It is the song of the oppressed. And we People of African descent, we know all too well about the songs of the oppressed. Don't we know some things about the songs of the oppressed? We come from a long line of people who had to learn how to sing through their oppression. Can I go ahead and lay it out? Oh, you know I'm going to lay it out because that is what I do. Every time I have an opportunity to bring my ancestors into the conversation about faith, oh, you best believe I'm going to do it because they laid the foundation on what it means to trust in God and believe in God even when your circumstances are telling you that you're not going to make it. So let me bring our ancestors in to this conversation. You see, during the Middle Passage, when our ancestors were loaded onto slave ships, they didn't have the weapons or military resources to overpower their captors. But what they did have was a song. Slave traders were able to take our ancestors from their home, take them away from their families. They were even able to take away their language. But what they couldn't take was their song. Our ancestors sat, crammed, and smushed in the bottom of slave ships and they would sing as a form of resistance.
even while facing the harsh conditions of the Middle Passage, our ancestors had a song. On the plantation, our ancestors had a song. While being forced to endure the, the cruel and crushing conditions of chattel slavery, our ancestors learned how to sing through their oppression. For their survival, our ancestors had to sing as a form of communication. You see, on the plantation, master had ears everywhere. Now, I'm not just talking about the overseer. I'm also talking about those uncles and aunties that would run back and tell master everything that was going on. And so for their survival, our ancestors had to communicate in code. They would use songs as a way of relaying information. If there was going to be a religious meeting, they would sing about it. If they were planning an uprising, they would sing about it. If they were planning to escape, they would sing about it. to be careful because masters would send the dogs but if they would just wade in the water it would cause the dogs to lose their scent so they had to communicate in code the middle passage the plantation uh, these are not the only places where we hear the songs of the oppressed the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. During the marches, protests, and sit-ins, as blacks were being hit, beaten, and spit on. Pause parenthetically, if you haven't seen Rustin on Netflix, yes, yes. When you leave worship today, for those of you who are online, after worship ends today, then you can go to Netflix and watch it. It is powerful. So during these marches and protests and sittings, as they were being hit, beaten, spit on, bit by dogs, they knew they could not fight back. So they would start to sing. Singing was our protest. As they confronted injustice and came face to face with racist police officers, we would sing. so glad and grateful that our ancestors didn't let anybody or anything turn them around 
family we know all too well the songs of the oppressed and the same reasons our ancestors had a song are the same reasons that Mary has a song in our text today in her song Mary says my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has looked with favor on the lowly state of his servant. In other words, let me give you the Reverend Maria Crompton version. In other words, what Mary is trying to get us to understand through song this morning is that God sees us. God sees us. God sees where we are and God sees us as we are when people look at us they don't see us for who we are they see us for who they want us to be but when God sees us God sees us as we are and not only does God sees us God sees what we're going through God sees our pain in our grief God sees us in our struggles God sees us in sickness God sees us even in our sin God sees us this song is about a God who sees the oppressed and I don't know about you, but that's show enough good news for me today. This song, Mary's song, the Magnificat, is about a God who sees those of us who are struggling under the systems of oppression. That is what this song is about. But that's not all. That's not all, because I don't do one dimension sermons. Y'all know that. So we're going to keep on uncovering and digging. Because not only does God see the oppressed, but according to Mary's song, God shows up for the oppressed. God shows up for the oppressed. Listen to what Mary sings. She says, he has come to the aid of his child Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary is reminding us that we serve a God who does not forget about the promises that God made to us. That God is a God who sees, but God is a promise keeper as well. Mary is singing about a God who shows up. After 400 years of divine silence, that's the space between the Old Testament and the New Testament, just in case you're new here, because all Elmwood folks, y'all know this. But just in case you're new, you logged on today and you knew, 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, after 400 years of divine silence, God shows up. And that is what Christmas is all about. It's about God showing up. If anyone were to ask you, well, what's this thing called Christmas about? Don't talk about trees and bulbs and, and wrapping paper. No, no, no. It's about a God who shows up. And here's the thing. And this may or may not be good news for you, but hey, listen, I'm going to give it to you. How you interpret it is your business. But listen, here's the thing. God may not show up when we want, and God may not show up packaged the way we want, but when God shows up, he shows up, and somehow it's always right on time. I, I, I don't know how he does that. That even when he's late, he's on time. Now that's just God, that's not you. 
Here, when we say the meeting starts at 7, you show up at 7. That's just for God. That ain't for y'all. Church start at 9.30? All right, let me, let me move on. Let me move on. Let me move on. When choir rehearsals start at 7 o'clock? Don't walk in here saying, well, you know, uh, you know, when God shows up, he's right on time. No, when you show up, you're late. There you go, Vin Roy. Welcome, 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 welcome. Mary's song is about a God who sees the oppressed. A God who shows up for the oppressed. But I'm not done. That's not all. Can we go a little bit deeper? This song, somebody said, we already deep enough. We going deeper. This song is also about a God who shows up as the oppressed. This was already good news. Now it's just gooder news. It's, it's, it's gooder news. It, God sees us, that's good news. God shows up for us, that's even better news. But then God shows up as one of, oh my. That's good news on another level. Listen, God not only sees the oppressed, shows up for the oppressed. But God, through Jesus, enters this world as one of the oppressed. And let me tell you, it matters. It matters. The fact that God shows up as a member of an oppressed community, it matters. The fact that God shows up in the womb of a poor Palestinian Jew, it matters. The fact that God shows up as the child of social and religious outcasts, it matters. I double dog dare you to ask me why. Ask me why it matters. Why does it matter? I'm so glad that you all want to learn something today. God, through Jesus, was born under a system of oppression. He was raised under a system of oppression. He was forced to learn under a system of oppression. Worked under a system of oppression. And let me tell you, just in case you're not getting it, why this is good news on this Christmas. It's good news for those of us who know what it's like to be born, raised, educated, and have to work under systems of oppression. It is good news for those of us trying to survive the oppressive conditions. It is good news for those of us trying to navigate systems and structures that were never designed with us in mind and they are not made for us to win. It is good news for those of us who know what it's like to fight against oppressive structures. It's good news for us. It's good news to know that God sees us. It's good news to know that God shows up for us. It's good news to know that God is one of us. And as one of us, God knows what it's like to be racially profiled. As one of us, God knows what it's like to be discriminated against. 
As one of us, God knows what it feels like to be judged and mistreated, to walk into the doors of a place and have people stare at us. God knows what that feels like. God knows what it's like to be the only one on the job, the only one in the class, the only one in the room, the only one at the table. God knows what that's like. God knows what it's like to feel as if your life does not matter. God knows what it's like to grow up with a target on your back, a mark on your life. God knows what it's like to be oppressed. I've already started to see this online, but just in case you find yourself in a space or in a room or at a table where people are discussing, debating, and deliberating about where Jesus would be if he were born today. Mary gives us the answer. Jesus would be in the same place today that he was in 2,000 years ago with the oppressed, with the oppressed. If Jesus were born today, he would be in the hood. He would be in the projects, in the shelters. He would be on the border with the victims of domestic violence. If Jesus were born today, he would be with those who are differently abled. He would be uh, in the hospital rooms with the cancer patients. He would be in the rehabilitation uh, centers with the addicts. He would be with the grieving and the heartbroken. If Jesus were here today, he would be with the social, socially marginalized, the economically disenfranchised. He would be with the less, the lost, the left out, and with the least of these. If you want to know where God is today, don't look for him in your clean and pristine nativity scene because he's not there. God is not there. God is in the rubble. God is in the rubble. Unless you think this isn't for you. Let me just bring it home for you because this isn't just good news for Palestinian Jews, but it's also good news for you and it's good news for me. Because when our lives are falling apart and when we turn around and we see the rubble of what used to be our lives, what used to be our families, what used to be our marriages, what used to be our careers, when, when we turn back and we see the rubble in our lives, I want you to know that it's good to know that God shows up in rubble. God shows up in the messiness of life, messy marriages, messy finances, relationships with messy people, family mess, work mess, church mess, emotional mess, addiction mess, mess we haven't had the courage to confront, mess that's holding us back, mess that's been keeping us down, mess that prevents us from becoming the people God needs us to be, mess when you are dealing, when I am dealing with mess, God does not exclude us. God does not leave us. God does not abandon us. God sees us, shows up for us. And if you want to get real, God will show up in the mess. God will meet us where we are. We don't have to clean up. We don't have to get fixed up. We don't have to do our makeup. We don't have to dress up. God will show up in the messy places of life. If God can show up in a manger, 
If God can show up and where you are, God can meet you where you are. With your messy attitude, your messy house, your messy relationships, your messy traits, God meets us in the mess of life. If you're looking for God, don't look for him in the clean, in the pristine places. Look for him in the mess, in the sickness, the sin, the sadness, the sorrow, because God is in the rubble. He's in the rubble. Here is what this Christmas reminds us that God shows up where we are and here's the beautiful thing God will show up as what we need in that moment God will show up see the people of Israel the people of Palestine didn't even know they needed a baby they didn't even know they needed a baby to be born in a manger. We didn't think that we needed a baby to be born in a manger, but God knew. God knew what they needed. That's why God didn't send a warrior or a king. God sent a baby because that is what they needed. And I want to come to you and I just want to remind you on this Chris, it, during this Christmas season that God will show up and God will become what we need God to be in that moment. That is why, come here, come here. That is why, they, they really leaned in, come on. That is why there are so many names for God. That is why there are so many names for God, because when God shows up, it's never just as one thing. When God shows up, God is showing up as exactly what we need God to be. Sometimes God will show up as shepherd. Sometimes as Jehovah Jireh. Sometimes as Jehovah Shalom. Sometimes God will show up and just be Emmanuel. Sometimes he'll be the Rose of Sharon, bridge over troubled water, shelter in the time of storm. He'll show up as wonderful counselor, prince of peace, lamb of God. Sometimes God will show up as way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, choir help me sing. Way maker. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. God that is who you are.
Thank you.